So Barry Fitzgerald came to see Sean O'Casey in Devon after nearly 30 years. It's a grand thing to see you again, Barry Arthur. It's a long, long absence. A long absence it is. Do you remember, Sean, the first night of the play on the stars and the road? I do well. When the serenity and quietness of the Abbey Theatre was turned into a, a roar and a rush, and Yeats came bounding out on the stage to oppose the howling mob. With his eyes flashing and his bushy hair waving like a bush that wasn't burning. And his arms extending over the yellowing, bellowing dust that's the traitor down the play. And he's shouting out of him, You have disgraced yourselves again. And then when the roaring became worse and they shouted out against O'Casey, he roared out at them with all the venom and vehemence that was in the great man. He shouted out at them, this is O'Casey's apotheosis. Probably because he, he had some peculiar belief in the magic of a word. It was an exception. I wonder did those that were listening to him, Barry, understand what the meaning of apotheosis was. Did you? I'm not answering that question. Did you understand? No, of course I didn't. You didn't? <laughs> well, neither did I. And I was wondering all the way home, and it was a very late hour when I left. I was wondering all the way home, what in the name of God was the meaning of apotheosis, and what had happened to old Casey that he had such an honor conferred on him. It was only when I got home, and quietly and secretly, you know, looked up the dictionary, I discovered that O'Casey was translated up into the gods. For me, the whole thing happened with the first production of June on the Peacock. Ah, uh, same here to me, too. And I met, for the first time, a most remarkable man and a great artist. <clears throat> that night of the first production of Juno. When I listened and heard your voice singing behind the, the wings, you know, sweet spirit, and hear my prayer, hear my prayer. I knew by there was going to be given a glorious performance that would add luster, not maybe to a great play, but a fine one. Sinclair and the rest of them and uh, the ones that uh, took part with you that particular night in June on the Peacock were good and s some of them splendid. But uh, you had that peculiar poetical touch in you that was denied to so many. Sally Allgood had it too, and so did Molly O'Neill, and the three great artists. I often since cursed the theatre that drove such an artist as you were out to seek a living in another medium. For you, Barry, in my opinion, and it's no little opinion either, you, Barry, were the greatest comedian that ever trod the English stage. Thank you very much, Sean. Well, now, Barry, we've talked a lot, and I think it's nearly time we took a little rest and headed at the rest with a drink. But before we do that, I'd love you to give a little tinkle to that song that you used to sing in the center of the first act of the play. When you the robins nest again. When the robins nest, nest again. again. And the, the flowers are in bloom. When the, the springtime sunny smiles seem to banish all sorrow and gloom, then my bonny blue-eyed lad, if you had to be true to them, as a promise he will come back to me. When the robins nest again, A theatre is not a physical body. It's an idea in a man's mind. Anything good in your mind, Sean? I don't know anything about playwriting. Modern, past, or playwriting that's to be done in the future. When I write a new play, when I sit down to try to write a new play, 
I have had the experience of many plays before, yet that new play that I am going to try to write gives me the same agony, the same trouble, the same effort, the same Herculean walk as the very first play I ever wrote gave to me. And I don't think there's a single person in the world can give you. He can tell you what his opinion may be about this playwriting and that playwriting and the other playwriting. But he doesn't really know anything about it. The best thing that was ever said about playwriting, I imagine, as far as my memory goes, was said by Yeats when he said, my curse on plays that have to be devised in 50 ways. Not really devised, Sean, set up. Yeats meant the number of sets. You know, what you're really talking about is... I have my own personal opinion on what, uh, the, on what way playwriting should go, on why, uh, the, the form that the drama should take. Not only now, but I wrote a book called The Flying Wasp 25 years ago, and I sat down on that book. I, uh, as far as I could uh, credibly do it, my opinion as to what the drama ought to be. It ought to be... No, not in any particular sense, but in a general way. It ought to be a combination of all the arts. There ought to be music in it, and ballet in it, and of course, dialogue in it, good dialogue in it, architecture in the form of the way in which the scene is constructed, scenic design, that's painting, every conceivable art that the human, the, 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 the human being knows should be crafted and intermingled and, and woven together in the drama. I tried to do that ever since I dropped off writing what was called realism. Though, honest to God, I don't know, and never did know, and never will know what exactly realism means, or any of the other forms uh, to which names are given, such as expressionism, impressionism, realism, all that sort of thing. Uh, they're all mysteries to me.